Welcome to Environmental Law Explored, a podcast series. The podcast of the American Bar Association section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. SEER is a member organization whose mission is to foster the success of a diverse community of environmental, energy, and resources lawyers, advisors, law students, and decision makers, and provide a premier forum for the exchange of ideas and information. This is the look back at 50 years of EPA, a limited podcast series where we interview practitioners in the development of environmental law and EPA. Today on the podcast, we have Mr. John Cruden. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with all of us. As you know, this podcast is really focusing on accomplishments and developments in the field of environmental law. Specifically, we're celebrating the EPA's 50-year anniversary. Let's just start with some of your background. Tell us how you got into the field of environmental law. So I've been an environmental lawyer um, most of my adult life. I did not start out that way. However, I graduated from West Point, so I was a military officer for a period of time. And then while I was in the military, took a leave of absence, went to law school, uh, and then uh, became a, a judge advocate. And at that time, this was the infancy, infancy of environmental law. But notwithstanding that, I actually uh, wrote part of a book on environmental law. I lectured at the uh, JAG school and then ultimately litigated on environmental uh, uh, issues. And so a number of years ago, the uh, uh, Department of Justice then uh, decided I would be a good selection to be chief of the environmental enforcement section at Department of Justice. So one Friday I left uh, Department of Defense. I was then the chief legislative counsel of the Army. And Monday, I became the chief of the environmental enforcement section at uh, Department of Justice, which is a wonderful job. You know, you know, 250 lawyers nationwide practice. We brought civil complaints for environmental uh, issues. And, and that was a, a very challenging, but a very uh, rewarding job. I stayed in that position until I was selected to be Uh, a career deputy assistant attorney general. The Department of Justice is divided into seven litigating divisions. Each one of them have political appointees at the top, the top being the assistant attorney general for that division. Uh, But each one of them has at least one career deputy assistant attorney general. And so I was selected to do that. In that context, I supervised largely uh, of the environmental side of the Department of Uh, Justice's Environment Division. I supervise the Environmental Enforcement Section, the Environmental uh, Defense Section, uh, and then from time to time, others. I stayed in that uh, position until 2011, uh, uh, when I accepted a position as the president of the Environmental Law Institute, which I loved, a great NGO dedicated to education and to cooperative work in the field of environmental law. I stayed there until Uh, The Attorney General, Eric Holder, called me one day and asked me if I would come back uh, uh, to the Department of Justice, this time as the political head, the Assistant Attorney General. So I had to be confirmed by the Senate. I was confirmed in 2014 and then immediately started as the Assistant Attorney General. I stayed there uh, in that position until the end of the Obama administration of January 2017, uh, and then uh, ultimately moved to my current position where I am Uh, a principal in the environmental law firm of Beverage and Diamond. So that's a quick summary of uh, my environmental uh, issues. I've done others. As you know, Emily, I was a past chair of the American Bar Association section on environment, energy, and resources. And I've done other issues, other things in environmental law. I've been the past president of the American College of uh, Environmental uh, Lawyers and the past president of the District of Columbia Bar, which is today with over 100,000 members, uh, the largest unified bar in the nation. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I mean, being chief of the environmental enforcement section in the early 90s, relatively towards the start of the entire like environmental justice movement, how did you approach that role? So we had, you know, I had a large staff, you know, we had uh, 250 people, 150 lawyers, most of them in Washington, but there were also small offices in about six different locations. And, you know, we, you know, we did not have investigators of our own, so we relied on other agencies, principally uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Interior, NOAA, 
Department of Agriculture and Defense that would give us, quote, referrals. These were the agency's views of places where there were environmental violations, which we would evaluate. And if we agreed, we would bring the case. Uh, and so the environmental enforcement section was entirely litigation. That's all we did was litigation. It wasn't a policy arm at all. Uh, um, but we were, you know, we were in trial uh, or arguing cases every single day. And so it was absolutely exciting. It was the early moments of Superfund law, the early application of uh, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. You know, we were making law and, and working with, you know, experts and our client agencies to, to take the most responsible position. I say it was a very exciting time and it was a really wonderful group of uh, uh, lawyers, you know, men and women uh, who, you know, many of them had dedicated their entire life uh, to environmental uh, law. And this was their dream job. The dream job was to be uh, in the environmental enforcement section. So it was a highly motivated and uh, I say an absolutely exciting position. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It's like the first generation of environmental crusaders. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, John supervised the litigation and then led the settlement negotiations with BP in the Deepwater Horizon case. Just a little bit of background. I'm sure anyone interested in environmental law <laughs> knows about the Deepwater Horizon case, but it happened in 2010. It was the largest marine oil spill in history. They sink over 60,000 barrels per day of oil escaping into the water. I mean, not only were there environmental impacts, 11 workers were killed. DOJ initiated civil and criminal investigations into the incident. How do you start to handle a case like this? Well, of course, you're not really prepared. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, can viv I can vividly remember April of 2010. So as you see, we're, so, we're at the 10-year anniversary uh, uh, being contacted immediately. I mean, as soon as, almost as soon as it happened, uh, we were contacted. And the spill itself continued for 87 days. Uh, and so it was every single day. Uh, uh, there were webcams looking at millions of barrels, ultimately, of oil. Uh, and this was coming into the Gulf of Mexico uh, in an area maybe 40 or 50 miles off of the coast of Louisiana. Almost immediately, of course, we knew uh, that even though this was right at the moment a, a huge environmental catastrophe and, and all, of the, all of the immediate work had to be on uh, restoring and protecting the Gulf uh, because it had such a horrendous impact, you know, 43,000 square miles impacted in the five Gulf states uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. So the very first priority had to be uh, protection and restoration. Uh, but we knew soon thereafter there would be a litigation on that case. I told you I started in 1991. Almost one of my uh, uh, first cases was the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Prince William Sound. I was not there for the event, uh, but I was there uh, and supervised the, the settlement process uh, and then the ultimate consent decree. So we had some knowledge of, you know, large oil spill, but the difference is the law had changed. Exxon Valdez inspired the Oil Pollution Act, and it was the Oil Pollution Act that was going to be the governing law uh, in the Deepwater Horizon. And so, uh, so we knew uh, that that was going to be a significant issue. So almost, I mean, I would say within a week of the spill, uh, several of us went to New Orleans, and, and then the Coast Guard took us out to the oil site, and you could see it from the plane miles and miles away. First of all, there were kind of rescue ships around the site, but it was gushing oil. Uh, and so it was very evident uh, uh, where it was. And already you could see how it was mobilizing. And, and then again, eventually it affected marine life. It affected beaches and tourism, shut down the fishing industry. So it had a gigantic impact. But you could see that, that it was going to have that mm -hmm. from the air. So we established, uh, Department of Justice, we established a litigation team right away. We did not file our case until much later, certainly after the bulk of the cleanup operations uh, had occurred, but we, had, uh, but we did establish a team. Uh, you asked me in advance to think about stories that would be relevant. One of them was we had to learn ourselves. This was a whole rig. The Deepwater Horizon is the rig that managed the oil well, uh, and the rig is like a city. 
And so we actually hired Canadian riggers uh, to come into the Department of Justice and teach us, teach us the language, teach us what was happening. Uh, we did not use them as experts in trial. They were really our educators to tell us what was happening and help us evaluate whether or not uh, the various ultimate defendants were uh, doing the right thing in the, in the cleanup. Uh, and so, so again, right away we had people on site and right away we were getting trained. And then I drew from uh, some of the lawyers that had been intimately involved in the Exxon oil spill. I brought them uh, out to Deepwater Horizon too. And so we had that advantage of uh, uh, using some of our own environmental enforcement section lawyers who had a lot of experience in oil spill because of Exxon. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, I can only imagine the size of the rig and that you would definitely need people to kind of walk you through it so you can figure out even just the general structure and where things are. To yeah, even was, begin to build your case. Like, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, bird, fish and turtle kill. And a lot yeah. of that was then being picked up because uh, there were, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of volunteers trying to clean up uh, uh, the water. Uh, well, for us, of course, that was evidence. So in, almost, in every one of those cases, we had to have a protocol. We had to have you know, a way to take the dead bird because they were going to laboratories to analyze them and tie them to the oil spill. Uh, and so there was a lot of actually training that was going on of just how do you handle uh, what is going to be a legal case uh, when your first priority is cleanup. All of that was happening, but we use some of the same, again, uh, methodological uh, uh, instruments as we use in Exxon. Right. Were you involved in the criminal and civil investigation or more on the civil side? I was not. I was entirely on the uh, civil case. So when the civil, okay. so, so in 2010, uh, when that happened, uh, I was then the career deputy overseeing the environmental enforcement section. And so I was very much involved then uh, in establishing uh, what was then our Deepwater Horizon trial team, uh, meeting with other federal agencies, and then ultimately we filed a civil complaint. Then I left. I left in 2011 to go, as I mentioned, to the Environmental Law Institute. And while I was gone then, they had two trials. Uh, they had a trial establishing liability, it established the gross negligence of BP, uh, and they had a second trial, which was quite important as well, establishing how much oil uh, was released. So those things happened while I was gone. And then I came back, and the very first thing, almost the very first thing I did uh, after you know, I was confirmed as Assistant Attorney General is went to New Orleans because the third trial was happening. So the trial, that trial was to determine the damages and penalty issues. We actually, and so the trial, the trial occurred while I was there, but we did not actually uh, ever get a decision out of that uh, because shortly after the trial is when we initiated settlement discussions. Well, you obviously must have done a very good job <laughs> because the Justice Department ultimately settled with BP for around 20.8 billion dollars, which was the largest environmental settlement in our nation's history. How did that feel? It took a while. <laughs> it, 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 uh -huh. absolutely, it absolutely took a while. It, uh, you know, so I started probably, you know, working almost full time right in the beginning of 2015. For all practical purposes, it took all that year for us to uh, uh, resolve it. Um, we had five states, all the five Gulf states were involved. All five Gulf states had their own lawyers and their own trial team. Many of them had already been in trial. Uh, in the federal government, we had five federal agencies involved uh, there. It was the first time in the history of our country, the Environmental Protection Agency was chosen also as a natural resource damage trustee. And we, of course, had the Coast Guard who were lead on their restoration activity and really done a, did an exceptional job. So we had a lot of players in that process. Uh, and of course, all of the local parishes and cities and towns, many of them had their own cause of action. The Oil Pollution Act uh, was way different than your normal environmental statute. Uh, because it also gave a cause of action for economic damages, lost taxation, uh, uh, what work you had to do to clean up the site. It was all part of uh, uh, the cause of actions that were available. 
Uh, and so we started, again, meeting with BP. We started very, very, very confidentially. Another story is uh, when I arrived uh, in New Orleans, uh, uh, the magistrate, we had a wonderful, very, very experienced uh, magistrate named uh, uh, Sally Sue Shushin, uh, and the judge was uh, uh, Judge Carl Barbier, a very experienced district court judge who was selected for that position by uh, the multi-district litigation panel. So they were excellent, but they were and very involved. Uh, but I arrived, I was in court, and I got past a note uh, that Judge Shushin wanted to see me, which was unusual because I thought, how does she even know that I'm here? Uh, so I went up to her chambers <laughs> and uh, she introduced herself. I had not met her and she said complimentary things about you know, our litigation team, um, but then asked me then, you know, do you, know, do you want to restart settlement? And I said, no, we're, we're going to try the case. There had already been several efforts to settle the case that have been unsuccessful. And I said, no, we're here to, you know, try the case. So we did. We, we put on the entire, entirety of our case. Uh, we thought it went on, went in rather well, uh, but it was very well litigated on both sides. Uh, and then when I went back to Washington, D.C., I got contacted uh, by the former FBI director, Louis Free, who ultimately became, you might have even been then, a settlement master in the case. So this is a former FBI director, but now a settlement master who said the CEO of uh, a BP would like to meet, personally meet with you. At the time of the spill, the CEO had been Tony Hayward, but uh, um, uh, Bob Dudley had taken over. So Dudley flew in from London, where his office, BP offices were, and he met with me. We had a few others. We, for a while, decided we were not having settlement discussions yet. We were just trying to decide whether well, no, we would have settlement discussions, and then ultimately did, ultimately decided we would go into settlement discussions. I wanted to have someone who had not been involved in previous settlement discussions, and he chose his uh, chief financial officer, Brian Gilbury, uh, to be their lead, and then I was lead for the federal government. And then we had an endless series of negotiations. I would say maybe two-thirds of them were in New Orleans, always with Judge Sushin was available, always with former judge, now magistrate free, uh, uh, that was there. And then sometimes we were in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. But there were very confidential negotiations. In order to participate in the, in the negotiations, you had to get permission of the court. And then we had a certified uh, that we were not talking about it. It was, you know, considered very, very private because we were not sure at all whether or not uh, we were capable of uh, settling the case. And it wasn't until probably mid that year uh, where we got an agreement in principle uh, that was uh, uh, announced. Uh, and then not until October of 2015, where we had the ultimate consent decree. So it was a very complicated, but I would say people did it in good faith. Uh, uh, the numbers, as you say, are uh, uh, staggering. It was the ultimately at $5.5 billion, the largest penalty of any environmental statute in any time. The natural resource damage component, which was over $8 billion, was also the largest of its time. So all of the numbers were uh, huge. I mean, just trying to calculate interest or calculating a payout schedule uh, uh, required us to have expert assistance uh, just because the quantum of money was so high uh, in that case. But by October, uh, uh, we had put together a draft restoration plan, a, a, a draft environmental impact statement, and then the, the consent decree. Uh, we lodged it with the court, and then we went through a very lengthy uh, uh, public comment period and eight public hearings. We had eight public hearings. I ran the one in Washington, D.C., uh, where people got to stand up and say whether or not they like the consent decree or not. And I, I know you mentioned economic damages. How did you begin to ascertain more intangible environmental damage? I mean, like you said, this was such a large scale event, really affecting an entire ecosystem, five different Gulf states. I mean, that seems like a a huge undertaking, especially whenever you're negotiating, to even have a starting number seems like it would be very difficult. So when you, you're absolutely right. And in, in a big, uh, gigantic case like this, or like Exxon Valdez, uh, uh, you have uh, a number of 
uh, uh, negotiations. In Deepwater Horizon, the first settlement was actually a private party settlement. You know, there were thousands of individual claimants uh, who themselves had, you know, either been damaged or lost income, uh, and they were able to settle first. Then the, the plea agreement that I was not involved in took place. Uh, and then what was left that had not been resolved uh, was the civil complaint uh, of the United States, uh, uh, the complaint also civil by the five Gulf states, uh, and then multiple uh, complaints uh, by individual cities, counties, and parishes. So all of those were in play. I told you I met you know, with the CEO personally, uh, uh, as we outlined, not surprisingly, uh, uh, what BP wanted to do was resolve everything. They didn't want to resolve just one part. They wanted to resolve all. Uh, and so that was our challenge, uh, is to not just do the environmental, because what I was responsible for in negotiating was all of the environmental damage that either had occurred or we, we thought might occur in the future. And then our challenge was to use the statute, uh, which uh, uh, allowed all the money that we recovered to be used exclusively to restore, replace, or acquire new land uh, to uh, bring the uh, injured natural resources back to what they would have been but for the polluting event. But at the same time, even though we were not negotiating uh, for the state or uh, uh, the counties and parishes, we knew that had to happen and they were on a parallel track. Uh, and so each of the counties got called very often by the settlement masters making uh, offers to them and then each of the states uh, uh, were able to come up with their own individual damages. But all that was happening in parallel. And so the, so the ultimate settlement is many settlements uh, that went forward. The one thing I didn't mention is also Congress was clearly involved. There were multiple congressional hearings. President Obama had his own task force. Coast Guard ran their own study as to what went wrong. And then Congress passed something called the Restore Act. Uh, and the Restore Act, this is like the first time this has ever happened, uh, the Restore Act said we will take 80% uh, of the uh, penalties that are achieved in the case, and they will be used also uh, for environmental restoration. I felt challenged by that because at that stage, we hadn't got a dollar in the penalty, uh, and we were busy litigating <laughs> all of that. And we have Congress already saying we're going to, you know, here's what we're going to do with the money that we had not yet achieved. But in any case... <laughs> That was the other part uh, is that Congress was clearly involved, clearly concerned uh, uh, about all of that. Uh, and I say that the one statute, the Restore Act, uh, which is still in play, you know, still in play right now uh, because uh, the projects uh, that we were uh, developing are, are now underway, many of them. Can you remember any particular struggles or pushback, whether it be bureaucracy or, you know, public opposition? I'll answer that in two ways. Let me, let me first do uh, the public comment period. Uh, and so environmental law, uh, as you know, but maybe some of the listeners don't know, is unique uh, in the sense that the environmental enforcement section, which I used to head, puts out its consent decrees for public comment before they go final. It's a process called lodging and entry. You lodge the consent decree with the court, you take public comment anywhere from 30 to 60 days, and then you bring back to the court those comments and you explain to the court, either I'm going to change the consent decree based on the comments or I want to go forward with them as they are. We did the same thing in Deepwater Horizon, only more so. So, you know, in October of 2016, put the consent decree out for public comment. I recall we got, you know, something in the neighborhood of 20, 29,000 comments. But we also did eight public <laughs> hearings all across all of the Gulf states, all in Washington, D.C., giving everybody a voice uh, as to, you know, what they think uh, should happen uh, and, you know, what they think should happen next. We paid a lot of attention to those comments when they came in. So, not surprisingly, uh, there were, you know, some comments thought we did wonderfully. Some comments think uh, we should have had more. Uh, we had comments that looked at whether or not we could adequately forecast uh, uh, what was going to happen in the future. You know, there was issues of habitat destruction, of the impact on dolphins, what was going to happen to food chain issues, not now, but 10 or 20 years from now. And, you know, people were concerned about that, and legitimately so. Our answer to that, by the way, is uh, uh, we designated in among that $20 billion worth of settlement, 
we put $700 million uh, that were available for things that we could not think of, that we had not, we, we do not know, unforeseen circumstances. Not exactly a reopener, which is a specific term in environmental law, uh, but available to the federal resource trustees for just that issue, just the issue of unforeseen um, circumstances. But there were a lot. You know, people want to know how, how is, does BP get a tax break for all this? They want to know that just about everything that you could think of uh, arose. But ultimately, uh, we took all those comments, which we transcribed. We transcribed the people who spoke and then brought it to the court. I don't know, maybe... April or so of the next year of 2016, uh, uh, that's when the uh, Judge Barbier approved the consent decree. And then, of course, it became uh, uh, the law of the land. That's after it. In the course of the negotiations, uh, uh, without question, there were many, many issues associated with having five Gulf states, five federal agencies, each of which had their own primary prioritized things that they wanted to do. Uh, each of them trying to protect their own citizens and their own jurisdiction. And so it, it was absolutely uh, important that we resolve all that. So we were not just negotiating with BP, we were negotiating with the other states. Uh, and so that at the end of the day, when the money was uh, brought, uh, that we would know where it would go and we would not have other fights over that. So unique to the consent decree, there's actually a governance structure talking about how much does each state get? How do they, what do they have to do in the future? Uh, uh, it sets up, it are, there was already a trustee console. This is a console very common in natural resource damages to uh, uh, try to figure out how to use any of the money and try to figure out what restoration needs to be accomplished. Uh, uh, but we empowered the trustee console. And so there were a lot of issues, not just of how much restoration we we're going to get, uh, but who, who had what responsibility in the future. Uh, for how that money was going to be used. Uh, so I, I would say both of those were challenges, Emily, that we had to uh, uh, resolve. What did you think were the most important considerations? I mean, whenever you're talking numbers and negotiations, I mean, I our, mean you got so many public comments. <laughs> There's so many things. That... I mean, we started out uh, with, in some ways, a simplistic goal, but nonetheless, we stayed with it. Uh, and that is, we wanted to bring uh, uh, the Gulf back to what it would have been had there not been an oil spill. Uh, so that was our goal from the very beginning. And then so we tried to structure the settlement uh, because uh, in a way uh, uh, that would allow for projects that would meet that goal. So let me give you a simple goal, a simple uh, example, and then a, you know something that I saw when I was out in the Gulf. Uh, and that is, well, let me go. When I was in the Gulf, as we were preparing for uh, our, our trial, we went out in boats uh, and did video displays of the impact of the oil on marsh and wetlands. Um, and it was very clear uh, uh, what happened because you could see for miles away as you came up uh, uh, to a small island of either marshland or wetlands, those that the oil had hit and those that the oil had missed. If it hit it, it was a dead zone. Nothing would be there. There would be no fish around it. There would be no birds on that little marsh island. Um, but if the oil missed it, then you could actually see uh, uh, sometimes fish jumping. You could see bird habitat. It was very clear, the impact. And of course, we were videotaping that to use it in trial. Well, ultimately, then the restoration process, what you want to do is restore uh, some of the oiled uh, wetland, restore some of that marsh. Uh, because not only is it extraordinarily valuable habitat for fish and birds, but it also serves uh, as a buffer uh, for storm and hurricane surges. Uh, and so it has a, a, a dual benefit. It, it just so happens that sometimes it's not that easy uh, to grow marshes and grow wetlands. So we had, to, we had to have experts tell us if we lost 100 acres of wetland, how much were we going to have to plant in order to get at the end of the day uh, uh, that 100 acres? And so that was a challenge. It was absolutely a challenge. You're trying to figure out what's the harm, and then you're trying to figure out what is the restoration uh, that you need in order to bring the Gulf back. So that was the challenge. Again, this is not Department of Justice. Now this is a whole world of scientists, some in the federal government, some of them uh, uh, not, uh, very, very much led by the Department of Interior's Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and the Department of Commerce's NOAA, where it was their scientists who were examining it, their scientists who did tens of thousands of samples uh, of the uh, uh, Gulf to figure out the long-term impact of oil and the impact of uh, oil on coral and dolphins and everything else. And then that was what ultimately led to the uh, uh, draft and then final uh, restoration plan. So that's both the challenge and also the part that I'm proudest of is uh, that the ultimate document is not a document that uh, means we're going to get a lot of money back to the federal treasury. That will happen too, by the way. Some of that money does go to the federal treasury. But the bulk of the money that was coming in because of the settlement is used to restore the Gulf with, with environmental projects. Uh, and the projects themselves are publicized so that the public can play a role in what they are and where they will be. Uh, and that's a process that's happening right now and will happen for the next probably decade because the money comes in you know, each year and each year the trustee console and the restore console are making decisions as to what environmental projects they want to prioritize for that particular time. States are doing that. The federal agencies are doing it as well. So it'll, it does without question take a whole period of time. But at the end of the day, I just feel confident that that beginning goal that I told you about, that we wanted to bring the Gulf back to what it would have been but for uh, the oil spill, I think we'll meet that goal. Switching gears a little bit, what do you think would have happened if you weren't as successful as you were? I mean, I think a big part of of the damages and the penalty is really to disincentivize these types of incidents, accidents from happening. And I mean, you were hugely successful in this case, but I mean, what, what do you think would have happened if you weren't? So, you know, certainly during my time period at the at Department of Justice and in the environmental enforcement section, you know, each of our goal always was to uh, stop the polluting event, bring the environment back, uh, and then try to make sure that that didn't happen again. So you do try to set incentives or deter others. And of course, I'm, I'm talking narrowly with you about the civil, civil settlement in Deepwater Horizon, which I'm proud of because I led the negotiations, but other things were happening. Without question, I, I already said Congress played a role. Department of Interior completely changed their management structure. At the time of the incident, it was Mineral Management Service that was responsible for you know, monitoring offshore rigs like Deepwater Horizon, and they created other agencies uh, inside of Department of Interior to do that. Uh, there are whole questions about how did this happen? Uh, what was the role of the, the, the blowout preventer? The blowout preventer was supposed to stop the oil from gushing in, in cases like this, and it did, ultimately did not work. And so there were other regulations then that came into effect. Coast Guard uh, uh, looked very carefully at what happened and so that they would learn from that. And so there, you know, and, and the states did as well. Uh, and so we've come a long way. And clearly, well, I'm hoping nothing like this ever happens again, but if it does, we know a lot more now than we did before. But I do think litigation plays a role. Um, and so had we not been able to bring the case, had we not been able to recover the natural resource damages and the Clean Water Act penalty that will all also be used as to restore the Gulf, uh, uh, we simply would not be seeing the Gulf of Mexico or uh, uh, those border states all have beaches and things. We would not be seeing them back in, uh, in the pristine shape that many of them are now. Uh, and so there, uh, without question, there was a benefit to the litigation, even though it took years to do and tied up court time uh, and resulted in an extraordinary <laughs> amount of things like depositions and interrogatories and document production. When I was looking at our document at one stage, uh, we were trying to figure out, you know, how much documents we had. And my team told me, well, we have like three terabyte of information. A terabyte would be the size of the Sears Tower if you were piling up paper. <laughs> we had three terabytes of information yeah. uh, uh, that we had collected in, uh, on, uh, on board. But notwithstanding all that, I still think that it was absolutely worth uh, uh, the effort and a great tribute to the men and women who put it all together. This incident and the result, I mean, it has such a lasting impact in the field of environmental law. I feel like Deepwater Horizon has just become part of our vocabulary. And as you said earlier, this is the 10-year anniversary of the incident. With respect to 
environmental accidents, where do you think we are today that may be different than 10 years ago? Well, I'm no longer at Department of Justice, obviously, and so I'm working with commissions and corporations and and talking to them all the time. Uh, Right after Deepwater Horizon finished, almost within the same week uh, that we settled uh, on Deepwater Horizon, I received a call from the Environmental Protection Agency that told me about the potential Clean Air Act violations of uh, Volkswagen. Uh, And so I turned my attention to another big company. The difference, though, big difference. Clearly, BP did not mean uh, for Deepwater Horizon to happen. That was an accident. 11 people died, a number of people uh, that got injured, but that was without question an accident, uh, an accident that we hope is preventable, an accident we think corporations across the world uh, have learned from in that case and have created more checks and balances to make sure they don't happen. But that's really quite different than the Volkswagen case, uh, uh, where it was absolutely very intentional, uh, what they did to violate the law. And once again, the corporations that I'm uh, working with now uh, are are spending a lot of time and money to make sure they do not get into a situation where you have these catastrophic accidents and have the checks and balances and whistleblower protection and all the things that you want to make sure that the workforce Uh, of a company is intelligent and briefed and are bringing to the attention of the management of the company any uh, deficiencies that could result in an accident or, God forbid, uh, intentional misconduct. Right. So perhaps it's brought more awareness to companies and the people that work for them. Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely true. So I think we're clearly uh, in a better place. It's just unfortunate that we have to be in that in a better place by having, you know, big things like VW and uh, Deepwater Horizon occur. Right. I think I think we can all agree the world looks a little different in 2020. Um, what do you think are the next steps in environmental law? So I've often uh, uh, thought that you know you're, you're you're talking about this being the 50th year since Environmental Protection Agency, the 50th year uh, since Earth Day. You know, Earth Day of Uh, 1970, where 20 million people uh, come out and celebrate a new awakening uh, in environmental uh, uh, law. Earth Day now with 192 countries celebrating it has become uh, uh, 1 billion people and our largest secular holiday. All that has occurred, but most of that occurred in what I think of as a top-down way where leaders in Congress, people like Republican John Chafee and Democratic uh, Ed Muskie came together to do historic uh, legislation, which is what we now think of as our media statutes, air, water, safe drinking, land, and so forth. And, and we're still working off of that legacy. But that legacy came to us again in a, in a top-down way uh, from Congress and then regulations and then uh, enforcement and the things that I did. I see the future of environmental law different now. I see it more bottom-up. I see it people that are concerned, people who now go to Congress. We, the most recent changes we've had environmental laws to the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA. And that really came because corporate America, individual citizens, environmental groups, they all came to Congress and said, we want to change. We want a better, more working law. And that law, now named the Frank Lautenberg Law, after our senator from New Jersey, uh, is making a difference. But that really is an example of bottom up, uh, where individual people are making a difference, uh, and that difference manifests itself uh, in a, a congressional act. And I can see more of that uh, happening in the future. There are still many challenges, climate change being the number one, but ones beyond that uh, that we have young people interested in, people like you, and really leading the way. And, and that's going to result in environmental change in the future, but it'll come from people as opposed to institutions. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. I feel like this youngest generation right now, I mean, still in high school, they're so interested in environmental issues and climate change and and using social media to really reach people that they might not have been able to before. What do you think the next generation should be focusing on? So we're seeing that some of that right now. We're seeing teenagers and, and young college students who talk to people like me like we are fossils. 
<laughs> uh, they, they talk about recycling. They talk about climate change issues. They talk about resilience in a very, very practical way, in, in a way that is more internationally focused than domestic uh, focus. I'm now speaking at a number of uh, uh, law schools and colleges and have done over the last year, and I'm always thrilled uh, uh, by listening to their enthusiasm and their adrenaline as they carry us into the century. Uh, the Pew poll that they do annually, the one that just, the most recent environmental poll uh, has, you know, two thirds of America uh, saying that we need to do more. Two thirds of America saying uh, uh, that environmental issues, as we know it, are enormously important. Emily, before we, we leave Deepwater Horizon, though, it just dawned on me, there's one, th one story I really haven't told others, and it is meeting President Obama on Deepwater Horizon. You want to hear that? Yeah, for sure. So after it was done uh, and we had uh, resolved the case, then I got called to come to the Oval Office, which is a very, very, you know, <laughs> amazing event. Uh, and so I okay. went over, of course, to the White House and uh, got briefed by any number of people about meeting the president. And I assumed that there would be a whole group of people there. And just as I turned from the secretarial office to walk in to the Oval Office, President Obama was standing waiting for me there. And it was only him. Uh, he reached out, shook my hand and said, quote, John, I'm glad to have a ranger on my side. Now, I told you I grew up in the military. I graduated from West Point. But one of my early schools, my early assignments in the military uh, were in ranger units. And so he had gone mm -hmm. through, looked at my biography and found out uh, that I had done that both in the United States and then in Vietnam, I was in a ranger unit as well. And he wanted to know, you know, he wanted to know what was going to happen in the future. He asked me some of the same questions that you're asking mm -hmm. me. Um, and I went through, you know, we'd already done it. I mean, you know, it was, this was an enforcement action. And so that White House stayed out of enforcement actions. I did not get any pressure on by the White House to either settle or, or, or told any terms. That was all done inside the Department of Justice. But I told him the things that I told you. I broke down how the money was going to be used and, and told him that I thought this was going to be a good legacy for any administration because I was so confident uh, that the money was going to be used in a very positive way uh, to restore, replace, and acquire equivalent resources as the statute required. Later, Somebody had taken a picture of me while I was there. I had no idea that anybody was taking the picture. My wife asked me, hey, what did you think of the Oval Office? I said, I have no idea. Uh, you're so, you know, you're so <laughs> in awe of being uh, with the president one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh -huh. uh, uh, that I didn't see the person taking the camera and I don't remember what uh, the uh, Oval Office looked like. What I do remember is as we finished, uh, he said, I want you to go back and, and I want you to tell all the people that were involved in all this that were in the federal government, how proud I am of what they did and how appreciative I am. And I did exactly that. I went back to my offices at Department of Justice. Uh, you know, I opened up my computer and, and I sent email to all the five federal agencies and all the people that I work with uh, to, to thank them. Uh, only this time I was thanking them on behalf of the president for doing a good job and a job that really would advance environment in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's an amazing place to leave it really is there are so many people involved, so many people assisting, helping so many hours and manpower to even finish a case like this. And this is just one of the, of the many cases that DOJ and EPA and all, all the agencies have really been involved in over the last several decades. Where do you see the EPA in another 50 years? So I hope they still exist. I hope, I hope by that time that we're, we're talking about different things. I hope that we have uh, met the international challenge of climate change. We have met uh, uh, the environmental justice challenge where, uh, without question, uh, minorities and poor people are disproportionately and adversely affected by uh, environmental uh, issues, that we've met uh, all of that. Uh, that we somehow figured out what to do with the fact that there isn't enough water for the world right now. And the United States is rapidly uh, seeing that itself. Uh, that becomes not only a natural resource, but an important, sometimes vital area. When I was at Environmental Institute, we worked with Jordan, which is like the third most you know, drought-heavy 
country in the world trying to figure out how do you allocate water, which is precious, and that's another challenge for the future. So I'm hoping that the Environmental Protection Agency exists. I hope it's bigger. I hope it's funded more. Uh, and I hope that the things that we're talking about, that I'm talking about with you, uh, Emily, I hope we've solved those and we're moving on to different things because I'm absolutely confident uh, that there will be more and different challenges, some of them that we're not even seeing other than watching hurricanes and typhoons and again, drought uh, right now, what that means for our future. Right, right. Well, leave it on a hopeful note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but thank you, Emily. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you for joining us and giving us your time and telling us about your experiences. I think I think everyone everyone will find this very interesting, kind of getting a, a different perspective. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our section, please visit our website at www.americanbar.org slash Please check where you found us for future episodes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>